Hello again, everybody. I'm Roger Hoover. Glad to welcome you back to the Crimson Tide Sports Network and welcome to Crimson Drive. It is live on this Thursday afternoon. Crimson Drive proudly presented to you by Coca-Cola. Really busy time on campus here at the University of Alabama as again, spring sports are, we can't even kind of say winding down, but we're still seeing a lot of important activity for the softball team, for the baseball team. Some other notes we have to pass along as well. But it's a jam-packed edition of Crimson Drive presented by Coca-Cola. Let's go ahead and take a look at what's coming up up on today's show. We will start with Alabama men's basketball. There was a powerful episode of Max Effort released by the basketball team earlier in the week about graduate assistant Ikenna Smart. So we'll first have a great conversation with Ikenna, followed by a conversation with the Viper, Alabama baseball closer Chase Lee, about his journey from not even making the walk-on tryouts to Alabama to being one of the best relievers in the Southeastern Conference. The softball team won the SEC tournament last weekend in Tuscaloosa. Now we're gearing up to host the NCAA. Regional, so our softball broadcasters Tom Canterbury and Gray Robertson will have a full breakdown of the previous week in the SEC tournament and what's ahead over the next few days in the regional. And then some more NCAA championship news for the Alabama rowing team as they have been selected to their first ever NCAA championships. We'll have reaction from Coach Petre and some Alabama rowers as well. Starting with the softball team, though, as we dive into the headlines, of course, the SEC tournament win last weekend in Tuscaloosa. How about that thrilling championship game against Florida and all the strikeouts we saw by Montana Fouts, Bailey Hemphill hitting those home runs, now the Alabama all-time leader in home runs. Just a tremendous weekend at the Rhodes House for SEC softball. Now everybody turning their attention to what is happening on the national stage with the NCAA Tuscaloosa Regional. Here in Tuscaloosa, Crimson Tide, the number three national seed for the tournament. However, it is a very tough regional field, as we'll hear Tom and Gray discuss. You have Clemson, the ACC champion in town, along with Troy and Alabama State. The season began way back in early February against Alabama State. Now the Hornets are here in Tuscaloosa for the regional. So we'll talk more softball with our broadcasters, Tom and Gray, coming up in just a little bit. Crimson Tide baseball team last weekend down in Baton Rouge went one and two against the LSU Tigers. A tight loss on Friday, a tight win on Saturday. Then LSU broke out the bats early and often on Sunday to get a big win in the rubber match and finale of the series. So the Crimson Tide now at home against number six Mississippi State this weekend starting tonight. It's one of those rare Thursday through Saturday series as the regular season comes to a close this weekend. Huge games coming up for Alabama baseball against Mississippi State and we'll be talking coming up with Chase Lee and also want to point out that Peyton Wilson great honors for the Hoover native as he was selected to the SEC community service team. At the end of the show, we'll have rowing talking about making it to the NCAA championships for the first time in program history. They've got some time to prepare for some very important meets as the championships will be held May 28th to the 30th in Sarasota, Florida, as the Crimson Tide really were consistent. That was the main thing for Glenn Putre's team all year long, just consistency in the water. And we'll hear from him as well as a couple of Alabama rowers coming up later on in the show. Also do want to note that the football team, their first game, game time has been set. The opener on September 4th against Miami in Atlanta and Mercedes-Benz Stadium. That'll be at 2.30 p.m. Central. The game will be televised on ABC. Of course, radio coverage here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. And assuming everything's like it was last year, should be on the air at 11.30 a.m. for three hours of pregame coverage to get you ready for the Crimson Tide and the Miami Hurricanes. Also some good news with the soccer team, three transfers joining the Alabama roster as Wes Hart continues to reload Alabama's roster after last year. Goalkeeper Brick Bollinger from Florida State, Ashlyn Sarapeka from Virginia, and then Riley Tanner from South Carolina all joining the roster. Tanner has been part of some great teams at South Carolina and the SEC, so three exciting additions for Crimson Tide soccer. Also the men's golf team, their season did come to a close at the Stillwater Regional earlier this week, but congratulations to Dave. Jay Sewell and the men's golf team on another terrific year and congratulations as well to Mick Potter and the women's golf team who are continuing their run in the NCAA championships. We'll have more on that coming up in next week's show. One other news item that we just got a little bit ago, we do want to mention that the Alabama men's basketball team Thanksgiving weekend this weekend will be playing in the ESPN Events Invitational. That'll be in Orlando, Florida and a really talented field that will include great teams like, let's see, just had it a moment ago. Here we go. You will see the Crimson Tide possibly against Belmont, 
Dayton, led by former Alabama coach Anthony Grant. Also, Drake, Iona. Alabama just defeated Iona in the NCAA tournament in the first round. Then Kansas, Miami, and North Texas. So keep an eye on that coming up a little later on Thanksgiving weekend. Nate Oates and his Crimson Tide men's basketball team will play in the 2021 ESPN Events Invitational. And that really segues us into this conversation about Alabama men's basketball. One of the players that Nate Oates coached while he was the head coach at Buffalo was a young man named Ikenna Smart, who played at Buffalo originally from Nigeria before making the move to the United States while he was in high school and eventually played college basketball, not only for Buffalo, but in the ACC for Wake Forest as well. He's now a member of the Alabama staff as a graduate assistant. And hopefully once uh, Crimson Drive is done, you'll be able to go online to the Alabama men's basketball basketball account and watch their latest episode of Max Effort detailing the life of Ikenna Smart and also his efforts to make sure that more shoes are able to come from the United States back to his home country of Nigeria, helping more and more people just play the game of basketball and just honestly just have a pair of shoes to wear. That's a very important message that Ikenna is starting to spread and I think you'll enjoy getting to hear firsthand the basketball journey of Ikenna Smart. Now let's take it into Tuscaloosa. Joined now by Alabama men's basketball graduate assistant, Ikenna Smart. And Ikenna, it's been a really busy 24 hours for you. We saw Alabama men's basketball post your story in an episode of Max Effort. Just what can you tell us about the last 24 hours as everybody starts to get to know you a little bit more, as well as your initiative, Smart Sports? Well, it's been a blessing and it's been a great um, opportunity to have that platform. You know, Alabama has been great to, to me, so I'm glad that I'm here. And, and, and it's such a blessing to have them supporting my vision to provide the youth athletic shoes to kids in Nigeria and other African countries who can't afford to buy one. So I'm glad and I'm, and I'm very, very, uh, you know, humble and appreciative of what they're doing for me. Yeah, it certainly was. And again, people can go to Alabama men's basketball's Twitter page, Facebook page and find that video. Uh, what made this the right time to kind of share your story? You know, there's never a right time for this. It, it's, it's so hard when, you know, young um, Africans or Nigerians like myself come here and, and, and we saw the opportunity here. It, the opportunity is great, but, you know, we, we have to always remember, you know, how hard it is where we're from for other kids, you know, how hard it is to find a single pair of basketball shoes, to even play the game that you love, that will give you that opportunity to travel to pursue your basketball dreams. And that one pair of shoes can, can, can stop you, can discourage you from training. It, it, it's, it's just that simple. So when I came here, I just, I've been sending shoes back, but I've never been able to send enough pairs of shoes. That is a problem. So I've always, I will always have my friends and other kids reach out to me, hey, can you send us shoes? Uh, you know, we, we, we heard about the shoes that you brought back. We didn't get some, and that always touches my heart. And and I I I just been trying to find ways to help other kids, you know, to get them shoes. That's certainly good to hear. And let's take a few steps back. Uh, first of all, how did you start playing basketball in Nigeria? Well, like I said in that in that uh, video, um, I've I've always played soccer, and I started as a young boy kicking anything I could kick without breaking my foot. You're talking about plastic plastic containers, you know, rolled up socks, oranges, you know, this is like a cultural thing. So we play sports barefoot, we run around. Uh, I just, I've been playing sports all my whole life. So I played club sports up to about when I was about to turn 15. Um, the stadium where we practice uh, soccer had a basketball stadium right next to it. And that was the only basketball court you could find in my hometown, you know, so I just, and I could never understand how basketball is played. You know, I was about to be 15. I thought it was too late to start learning. You know, just one day on a beautiful afternoon, I went over there after my soccer practice. And the coach, you know, I was about six, eight, six, eight, nine, maybe six, eight. I think I was about six, 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 six eight to be exactly correct. And he told me, hey, man, you should try this out. You are tall enough, you know. And I told him, look, it's too late to start learning this game. I don't understand it. You know, there's a lot of rules. He said, look, you know, if you can start just from rebound on the ball and, you know, don't let anybody score a layup and that right there, you know, will, will be a start for you. I said, well, I think I can, I can give it a try, you know, if it's that simple. And that first day, man, I came back every day of the week to play basketball there. You know, I just found a new love and, and, and that was basketball for me. 
Well, that's certainly exciting. And then uh, what opportunities allowed you to come to America to play basketball? Obviously, you know, I've, I've, I, have, I, have, I've already developed a, a good athletic uh, base by then. And I was, I was a little bit athletic. I, was, uh, I had great footwork from soccer. So I was able to move around. And I picked up the game of basketball very quickly. Um, just after one year of playing, uh, you know, the coach had connections in, in, the, in the U.S. So he was able to make some calls and got me a scholarship to relocate to, to U.S. and play basketball and, and, uh, and pursue my academic uh, and, and, and further my education. And what was the toughest part of your transition to the United States? The, the toughest part, I would say, would probably be coming to a country where you don't know anyone, you know, um, but I've been blessed to meet great families. I mean, let me take a minute and, and give a shout out to my host family in North Carolina. Um, you know, they've sort of adopted me and they've given me life. They, they've given me everything they give to their own children. Um, they've supported me through high school. I, 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 what words can describe what it did for me. They made the transition so easy for me. Um, so it, it's a matter of getting into the right family and meeting the right people. And I was so blessed to meet the right family and meet the right people to help me uh, on, you know, into this uh, great journey. Well, you started playing high school basketball. Not long after that, a lot of colleges start recruiting you. Uh, what can you tell us about the recruiting process, ultimately what led you to Buffalo, and then first meeting Nate Oates? It was fun, you know, how it goes. I came in here, started playing high school in AAU. Really, AAU, I played my first AAU for CP3 All-Stars. Then I ended up playing for uh, Team Loaded in North Carolina. So in Buffalo was one of the schools that started re recruiting me at the time. You know, basketball, basketball Buffalo. The head coach at Buffalo was uh, Nero, uh, Bobby Hurley. You know, Nero was still an assistant. They, this is 2013, 2014. Uh, Levi was the, was also an, an assistant at, at the time. So Levi would come down to North Carolina and watch my high school game and also AAU games. Um, and I, I love Buffalo because coming from Nigeria, I was looking for a school that had that international, uh, you know, uh, group. You know, the geography was, uh, the demographic of uh, Buffalo was really great for me and I thought it would fit uh, for what I was looking for. So, you know, going there, I know that they, they had more international students and, you know, I love the coaching staff and I got to know Coach Holtz, Bobby Hurley and Levi and they assured me that, you know, they were going to support me to help me uh, develop my basketball uh, further. And then what are you most proud of when you look back at your playing days at Buffalo and then also at Wake Forest? The relationship I built, you know, this in 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 this, in this game and in this journey, you have to build relationship. I cannot push you in, in 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 a place to build relationship. I think the relationship I've built over these years are really meaningful and they are so important to me. And I've you know I've I've been blessed to have really really good teammates who I'm um, you know I consider my brothers now. Uh, we talk, you know, you're talking about from. 2014 when I got there to when I left, moving on to work for us, I've got to meet great people. I've got to grow. I've got to immerse myself into the American culture. And these people really helped me involve. So a really outstanding college career for you. And then what led you to Tuscaloosa? Was it just staying in touch with Coach Oates, Coach Hodson from your Buffalo days? Part of that, you know, we have such a great culture in Buffalo and and and, and cultures are really key in, in college athletics. If you can develop a strong culture where kids can really learn and grow into a great individuals, so I think that helped me uh, mature at Buffalo. And I love Coach Oates and his staff. And I just love how he approaches the game. I thought he, he did a good job changing the culture of Buffalo and kind of bringing the guys together to play for each other. So I wanted to, I also love his, you know, approach on how he brings in new ideas into the game. You know, he's a statistical guy, so he loves stats, you know, so he he brings a number every day before practice. Hey, we shouldn't bat in this, you know, we got to take more shot from this angle or always finding new ways to make us better as a team. And I love that about him, you know. He would always, this is a true story, after the game, he would always send me a test late night, like, late night, talking about 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 1 a.m. in the morning. He'd be like, hey, you know, you missed this checkout. Or, you know, you know what I mean? Something, it just, it shows you that somebody really cares about the game. 
you know, so I know he cares about the game. He cares about the players and he wants to win. So, you know, this was the best place for me to come and learn from, you know, another perspective now, not as, not as a player, but as a staff or part of the staff. So he made it easy for me to come here to work with him. So you worked for the Crimson Tide as a grad assistant, and you just mentioned the culture you guys had was really strong at Buffalo. And I imagine when you joined last year's group, when you get to meet Herbert Jones, John Petty, Alex Reese, Tyler Barnes, all that great senior class, and then all the dynamic playmakers Alabama has, you had to recognize that this was a really special group of players that we have here in Tuscaloosa. Absolutely. You know, we had a great senior class, um, and, and I'm glad, you know, um, some of them are going to move on to do great things in their career. And if you have a team where the seniors are leading by example, you know, usually you you have a great team. And that's what we had. We had a team where Hub Jones, you know, leads every day by example by coming to practice and playing hard, John Perry, Tyler Barnes, Alex Reese. And, you know, the younger guys love that because it kind of, it spills over to the younger guys, you know. It, 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 creates, it creates this spillover effect to that. You know, the younger the young guys now are going to have to step it up and carry on that leadership onto the next level. So that's why I'm looking forward to the next year and uh, to what we are going to do. Yeah, we're certainly looking forward to it in uh, Tuscaloosa. Just how much have you enjoyed uh, living in Alabama and getting to meet people around the University of Alabama? Alabama is great. It's actually my first time in Alabama, and I've been here for almost a year now. So uh, it's been great, man. I love the... Uh, I love the food down here. Um, I love going to the strip and all kinds of restaurants are located in that area. Um, and the people are great. You know, I, I've gotten, I've gotten uh, to meet some of the donors as well. And, you know, they are so nice to welcome in. Um, and I've really enjoyed, uh, you know, being here and, and getting to know a lot of the fans. Well, the fans have certainly been helping you out, and a lot of fans that are watching this would like to help you out even more. Again, sending shoes back to your native country. Just what can you again tell us about smart sports and ways they can help out? Well, smart sports is, is the foundation that I've created. I created this foundation when I was at Wake Forest. With the help of Wake Forest Clinic uh, Law Farm, they helped me establish as a nonprofit, so we incorporated. I filed my articles on incorporation down there. I'm in the process to become tax exempt. So when that is done, then I will become an official nonprofit foundation. But for now, I have partnered with Samaritan's Feet. Samaritan's Feet is a nonprofit organization in North Carolina. They're located in Charlotte. They're gonna help me collect donations. That way I don't get in trouble with the, you know, task of, you know, task us, the, 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 the department. Um, so I try to avoid doing, uh, you know, going down, down uh, doing uh, anything that can violate, uh, you know that so i'm partnering with them to help me collect donations and so if anybody wants to help i have a link in my in my twitter uh account if you click on that link you can make a donation um i'm collecting all the shoes i'm hoping to ship about 500 pairs of shoes i know they're gonna cost a lot of money to ship and so i would definitely need support i would definitely need you guys to go in and make a donation so i can ship the shoes to kids um you know i really hate to have the shoes and not be able to ship it this, this this summer because of the money um so please i i know with your help and you know we can we can get some shoes to kids this summer well we look forward to it i can it's a great mission you're a part of and we're so glad you're part of the alabama family just thank you for joining us on crimson drive this afternoon and all the best and we look forward to seeing a lot of shoes making their way uh, across the ocean but thank you again for all the help you've given us today in roll tide Thank you for having me. Chase, first of all, when did you first hear the nickname The Viper, and did you like it from the start, or did it take some time to get used to it? Uh, I think I first heard it uh, 
when I went to summer ball, uh, the, we had an announcer that called the games and he said, Hey, there's this nickname for you on Twitter. You go by, or is that, you know, what's that about? Should we start saying that? And I was like, what are you talking about? And then, uh, slowly but surely that I think it actually caught on pretty quickly. And then, uh, you know, it kind of stuck. And so since then, uh, that's what people have called me. And I think it's pretty funny. Uh, I enjoy it. Uh, I guess that's how it started. Yeah, I guess at this point, you got to run with it. Uh, Alabama yeah. just made a really cool Viper video for you the oh, other yeah. day. Just You got to love seeing stuff like that and love seeing maybe later after the game, just roll back through the tweets that come in every time you enter the game. There's the Viper gift by all these Alabama fans. <laughs> yeah, I actually don't have Twitter, but like we got on the bus uh, after the LSU game on Saturday, and everybody was like, hey, you've got to watch this video. And uh, so I went and looked it up, and that, that video was really cool. Uh, so that was neat. Uh, and you know, it's cool to see like all the guys that, you know, going back that show me tweets and things like that of, of how invested the fans have been into that nickname, I guess. Any other good nicknames on the team? I know at times fans have called Brock Guffey the wizard, uh, Landon Green, maybe the cowboy, but any other good nicknames on the team? Uh, not really. Uh, everyone's kind of got their own little inside nickname, uh, but nothing that really uh, sticks, uh, I guess, as good as that. Well, let's go back for a minute, Chase, and talk about your baseball journey. Uh, first of all, what made you decide on Alabama after your high school playing days were done? Um, well, growing up down the street, it's, it was the easy choice. Um, I had a really good academic scholarship that made it the most affordable school I could go to. Um, and they were one of the only programs in the state that had the degree that I uh, got. So uh, with limited options and it being the best financial availability and I was I grew up an Alabama fan it was a pretty clear clear cut choice just to come here so when you got on campus uh, what were the next steps for you to try and make it to the baseball team uh well honestly I didn't even know they had tryouts uh so my mom found a link online somewhere and uh sent it to me it was like hey they do tryouts and I was like what is that basically uh so I filled out some paperwork uh, I think I had to get a physical and be an enrolled student and fill out some other little things and then um, basically turned it into the baseball office and waited on them to set a date and they and a time and then kind of just waited around until they decided to have a tryout. What was the tryout like for you? What kind of feedback did you get from the coaching staff? Uh, it was really fun. I think so. The first first year I tried, I didn't make it and uh, I didn't expect to. Uh, it wasn't really any good. I was just going just to well to say that to leave no regrets for sure, but also just to you know get to play on the field. Uh, or take BP on the field, things like that. Uh, so I tried out and, you know, didn't receive much feedback. Coach Bohannon was pretty straight up with me and said that I'm, you know, you're not re really any good uh, realistically. And if you ever want to try to play anywhere, you're going to have to learn to pitch sidearm or get a whole lot better at something else, uh, basically. And so that was kind of the feedback I got the first time around. And, uh, you know, that was actually more than I ever thought about I would ever get. So yeah, what were some of those steps? You hear that news, you maybe think about it for a couple of days, but then what'd you do after that? Yeah, so I actually uh, went home and didn't really do anything with it for about a month. I, you know, I wasn't really sure if that was something to, you know, go for. It seemed like a long road, uh, pretty uphill. And, you know, kind of my entire career was, you know, either you're not good enough or you're not ready yet or things like that, too small, not fast enough. So I, I don't know if I was trying to figure out if I could handle another letdown of, okay, I'm going to work at this for a year and then not make it again or whatever that may look like. Do I want to do that? And so I wrestled with that for about a month or so. And then uh, around like October-ish, I, I decided that, you know what, it's only a year. Uh, I can do anything for a year. And at the end of the day, if I don't make it, I wasn't going to make it anyway. I'm already not there. You know, what's there to lose? So uh, I reached out to, um, you know, a a friend of mine and they said they suggested a, a pitching coach to me and he ended up uh has a little facility right beside Waterburger uh over on McFarland and so uh you know I called him and was kind of gave him a rundown and we started basically from scratch and then uh, I got on YouTube and tried to watch every big league sidearm pitcher that has either ever thrown in the big leagues or is currently still throwing and just tried to watch everything I did and try to replicate it honestly uh, so I'd play YouTube on and then stand in the mirror and try to do exactly what they did um, and that for a couple months and then 
I got towards like January and then the coach that I was working with said, Hey, I think there's this men's league or something called club baseball. He didn't really know, you know, what it was. He had just heard of it. I was, he was like, I think it'd be beneficial just to face some batters. He thought it was just like your standard, like men's league. Didn't really know it was affiliated with the university. And so you know, I figured out you know, how to get in touch with them. And then that kind of contact led to, you know, joining the team and figuring out, Hey, this is a, you know, like a collegiate intercollegiate league. Uh, affiliated with the university so it's kind of like bland uh, it's not just your Sunday beer league softball whatever uh, it actually is competitive baseball to an extent so then I joined with them uh, you know tried out and made their team and then uh, played a full season with them and then you know kind of led to leading up to the next year's tryout. Yeah, and going with that sidearming, you're watching all these YouTube videos. Are there two or three pitchers you really tried to replicate who became became some of your favorite guys to watch when you're trying to learn? Yeah, so uh, the guy that I would say I, I stuck with the most was Steve Ciszek. He was with the, you know, I think he was with the Cubs at the time, so that I was watching videos. Uh, he's now with the Angels, but that was the guy who uh, I think he, he threw the hardest from a lower slot at the, that time, and he was having – like I think a career year that year. So I was like, all right, let's, let's watch this guy and figure out what he does. And then I watched other guys like Darren O'Day, who's now with the Yankees. Um, but uh, I watched a lot of his stuff. Um, and then I watched a lot of the bigger, like your big name guys like Jacob deGrom and Max Scherzer. Cause I mean, if you throw hard, you gotta be doing something right. And so I would just watch them and figure out, okay, what do they do really good? And can I do that bent over and throwing from the side? So I take like, things that they did and try to kind of mesh it with guys that threw sidearm and combine it into kind of what I'm at right now. What are some of the key fundamentals to throwing sidearm? I know you have to repeat your delivery, but it's such an odd angle. It's not quite over the top, but that is more repeatable. What do you have to do kind of mentally to make sure you're always in the right place to pitch? Uh, early on, it was just trying to figure out where I wanted to be. Uh, I tried to do different arm slots. I tried to go really low and scrape the ground. I tried to you know, be a little bit higher, uh, you know, mixed in, you know, just about everywhere to figure out what fit for me. So that was the beginning is just figuring out what was the most comfortable and repeatable spot to throw from. And, you know, over the years, that's changed a couple, you know, degrees or so, but um, that was probably step one is just figuring out, okay, where do I want to throw from? And then after that, trying to figure out how to repeat it. And then, you know, after, you know, it's, we're going on year three. So right now it's muscle memory uh, more so than anything. I don't really think about uh, my delivery. Uh, but in years past, it was okay. I want to be, you know, driving to the plate with my lower half. Cause I think a lot of people, when you think of sidearm, you just kind of fall over and, and throw it from as low as you can get down. Um, but when I was learning, I guess I was trying to pitch, not throw, if that makes sense. Um, so I wanted to learn how to pitch from a sidearm slot instead of just throwing, you know, the standard, you know, 80, 84 that every, sidearm guy seems to have so I tried to figure out how to throw hard and so that was kind of you know I figured out how to use my lower half that was kind of my mental cue was driving to the plate instead of just falling over and, and throwing um, but now it's more just muscle memory of you know that's kind of just how I throw now if that makes sense. so you do make the Alabama baseball team how helpful has coach Jackson been the last few years for you incredibly uh him and now Kyle Cameron helping out but they're have you know fine-tuned me into you know what you guys see on the field uh if you look back and look at footage of me from you know that first fall that I made it you would be like who was this guy because that's uh two different guys compared to where I'm at today and where I was when I first joined the team and that's all credit to you know them uh, pointing me in the right directions as well as you know coach Price and Sean uh you know kind of showing me the ropes of you know how to work out how to train and and then combining all of that and, and kind of pointing me to where I'm at now, uh, little by little. Uh, not many major changes, but a little bit of like, uh, maybe you need to lower your leg kick. Uh, I had a really high leg kick when I got here. Uh, so lowering your leg kick and being quicker to the plate, um, things like that. Uh, and then repeating deliveries, uh, kind of stuff like that's fine tuned me into you know, where I'm at today. Are you really comfortable coming in in any situation out of the bullpen? We've seen you have some extended relief before, really long outings. We've seen you also be kind of that traditional closer, get three outs in the ninth or keep it a tie game. What do you like the most? Are you comfortable with anything? Uh, I mean, late late stuff is obviously the best. I don't like the coming in early and trying to 
you know, throw six, seven, eight, nine, or whatever. Uh, if I'm going to throw extended, I'd rather it be in the extra innings where everything's uh, really important. Uh, not that the sixth, seventh, eighth isn't important, but uh, where the game's really on the line. But I, I really like the high leverage situations where, you know, if I mess up, the game's over uh, type thing. Uh, you be able to pitch with pressure. Uh, it's been a really fun role uh, to have, and I really enjoy getting to come out uh, when the game's a lot. Well, now Alabama just has three games left in the regular season, uh, starting with Thursday night against Mississippi State. Just tell us kind of where this team is kind of from a mindset perspective, really making sure that these three games go the right way for the Crimson Tide and the final games this year in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, well, uh, it's no secret we're on the bubble uh, trying to get in. Uh, looking from the outside right now, we, we know we have to get to uh, – you know, the magical number was 15, but I think with, since we canceled one game, I think we, we really just want to get to 14. So that makes us have to win. We have to win this series. Uh, and I think most guys on the team realize the importance of playing this weekend and also who we're playing. Um, you know, Mississippi State's not a rollover, uh, which no team in the SEC really is. But, um, you know, everybody's really excited, but we have to come out tomorrow night or Thursday night and uh, really just win the first inning. Uh, I think that was a, a struggle for us early as we tried to win the series before we won the game. And um, so the past couple of weeks, we've really just been focusing on, okay, let's win the first inning. And then after we win the first inning, let's win the second inning. Um, so everybody's mindset is really just to come out and throw the first punch on Thursday night and hope, and then try to win Thursday night and then which eventually lead to winning a series. Well, really excited. Alabama baseball again, closing out the regular season this weekend against Mississippi State and then the SEC tournament after that, and then hopefully a berth in an NCAA regional. But Chase Lee is a big reason why Alabama's had so much success this year. So, Chase, we've just enjoyed getting to hear your story a little bit on Crimson Drive and wish you all the best moving forward. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Roger. This is an Alabama softball regional preview here on Crimson Drive. I'm Tom Canterbury alongside Gray Robertson. And Gray, before we talk about the NCAA regional that Alabama is going to be hosting in Tuscaloosa this weekend, a quick look back at the SEC tournament, Alabama, a championship one here this past week as the Crimson Tide won the SEC tournament for the sixth time in program history. The second time Alabama has won it here in Tuscaloosa after Alabama did that back in 2012. Started things off with a 5-1 win over Kentucky, a 6-5 win over Tennessee in the semifinals, and then an all-time great performance in the championship game by Montana Faust as she throws the complete game shutout over the number one seed Florida in the championship game. Montana Fouts got all but one out in this tournament and was just lights out. 20 and two-thirds innings pitched, 39 strikeouts. She gave up three earned runs all week long. She was incredible and truly a remarkable performance from her as well as the other star, Bailey Hemphill, SEC Player of the Year, somewhat quote-unquote controversially around the country. People were saying it should be Kayla Kowalik. Kayla Kowalik had a great case, but Hemphill – should have won the award and did win the award and then backed it up with an incredible two home run performance against Kentucky. She had the clutch home run performance against Tennessee in the sixth inning and then did what she had to do against Florida. Uh, I thought the whole team was fantastic. The team defense on the weekend and on the week was wonderful. Um, just so many positives. It came from everywhere in the lineup. Kaylee Tao, great tournament. Taylor Clark, a real revelation in the field and had some big hits at the plate. Alexis Mack was solid as ever. It just came from everybody. And I think this team is hitting their stride in the best possible way going into the most important part of the season. And something Alabama has been able to do uh, a lot of the year and something they've done is Alabama is currently on a 13 game win streak. Um, 
is score and score early as Alabama did that. And you look at the championship game in particular, Alabama scores three runs in the top of the first inning. Alabama was the road team as the lower seeded team in that championship game against Florida. Alabama scores three runs somewhat unconventionally on a suicide squeeze and then on an error. And then KB sides does some wizardry on the base paths and a two run score after that. Um, but the tide got on the board quickly and gave Montana Fouts that cushion and she was lights out, didn't allow a hit by the Gators, anything after the second inning. Which gets crazier every time you say that. I mean, that's not a bad Florida team, obviously. They're number four nationally in the NCAA tournament. They were co-champions of the SEC. It's a good squad. And Montana Fouts held them down. I think in particular, the bottom of the sixth really sticks out. She got Sharla Eccles to pop up on a pitcher's pitch. That was a waste pitch, if you will. And Eccles chased and popped it up. And then to get Kendall Lindemann looking on a strikeout, just uh, just incredible. I mean, everything was working for Fouts. The velocity was fantastic. The movement was there. Her rise ball just continues to jump at the perfect time and fool these batters. And opposing hitters can't lay off. And again, Alabama, like you said, striking early, setting the tone in all these games. They've scored in the first inning in 10 of the 13 games during this streak. They've scored in the third inning in 10 of the 13 games in this streak. What does that mean? Well, if they're not scoring in the first, they're still getting ahead pretty quickly in these games, which, by the way, keep in mind, most of those games in the 13-game win streak have been against ranked foes. So they're doing it against good competition I mean, again, I go back to what I said. This team is peaking at the right time. They're playing their best softball of the season. They're motivated. They're playing together. There is a unity about this team that is tough to find in college sports sometimes and in sports in general. But this team is has banded together in a way that you don't see everywhere. And that is what makes this postseason run potentially very exciting. In the SEC tournament, again, I don't – can't say enough about the crowd and the atmosphere that was created at the Rhodes House as well. Uh, in his, historically, uh, host teams don't particularly do very well in the SEC tournament. As I mentioned, Alabama is the only other team to do it to win a conference tournament title at home. They did that in 2012. And those are the only two times the host team has even made the championship game of the SEC tournament. But it was so great to see the crowd come out. Uh, we weren't in our normal spot. We were outside the booth. So we were really out amongst the, the crowd and you could really feel it. The brickyard was full all week long and uh, they got recognized by Patrick Murphy and, and the team afterwards as well. But really can't say enough about the atmosphere that was created in uh, the best place in the world for college softball, uh, the Rhodes House. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked about it in post game after the Kentucky game. As soon as that Arkansas Tennessee game beforehand ended, Something shifted. You could feel it in the atmosphere. It was big-time softball for Alabama once again. And the crowd showed up, and they were loud all week long. It was really an incredible atmosphere, and it was something that I had missed. It had been a long time, Tom, since we had felt that. I mean, basically since Supers in 2019, you know, there were good crowds at times in 2020, but we've seen early in years, you know, it, it takes a while for the place to really get full for some of those games. This felt different, and it was, I think, certainly something that aided Alabama on their run to the SEC Tournament Championship. So Alabama wins the SEC Tournament Championship and gets the number three overall seed and will be hosting the Tuscaloosa Regional here this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The two seed is the Clemson Tigers. The three seed is the Troy Trojans, and the four seed is the Alabama State Hornets. Alabama will start things off against Alabama State on Friday. Uh, but then the, the likely matchup of Alabama and Clemson, as it seems to happen in every sport, now Alabama and Clemson will play in softball in a tournament uh, postseason setting. And uh, the Tigers, only their, full, it's their first full season, they started the program in 2020, got to play half the season, and then things got canceled. So in their first full season, they win the regular season conference championship in the ACC, and then they come to Tuscaloosa for regionals. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I mean, Man. this is 
this is going to be such a compelling matchup because this is a Clemson team that has a superstar and that's Valerie Cagle right now. She would be my pick for freshman of the year nationally. She's one of the finalists for that award. I believe she's still a finalist for national overall player of the year. And if Rachel Garcia didn't exist, Valerie Cagle would be the best two way player in the country. She leads Clemson in batting average at 414. She's 26 and five in the circle this year with an ERA just over one, 1.06. Opponents are hitting 176 against her. She is a bona fide superstar. And it's going to be really interesting to see how she handles and how this entire Clemson team handles an atmosphere like Rhodes. Because Clemson is really good. You look at the overall record, 42-6. and six. You might say, why are they not hosting? Well, the RPI was low because they didn't really have the toughest schedule. They have never seen an atmosphere like they will this weekend at Rhodes. And so it'll be very, very interesting to me to see how the Tigers handle that. And, you know, honestly, if they get past Troy, this is a Trojans team that has one of the best arms in the entire country. Leanna Johnson is still right up there in strikeout. She's got 242 this season. She's been in the top 10 pretty much all year. This is not a Troy team that you can take for granted either. And Alabama State has just ran through a SWAC tournament. Alabama has played Alabama State a couple times this year, including a perfect game on opening night. Uh, but they're they're playing much better than they were at that point. So uh, Alabama's going to have to play well even in the first game against Alabama State. But then, yeah, the likely matchup with either with Clemson or Troy in game number two on Saturday uh, should be well of a ball game. And uh, we, you mentioned, you know, having not played Clemson, having not played in an atmosphere like Rhodes, uh, even at 50 percent, like we saw this past week in the SEC tournament, you know, 50 percent of Rhodes is more than the uh, complete capacity of a lot of places in, in the nation, including what Clemson usually plays in. So um, it's going to be it's going to be a, a tall task, I think, to ask a team that has that is only playing in their second season first completely full season but they're certainly uh very capable so alabama's gonna have to play play well this weekend continuing the run they're currently on to to advance as alabama currently right now a 40 game win streak in regionals which is a stat uh it's really amazing it doesn't get talked about enough that alabama you know we see teams every year that are highly ranked highly seated that will drop a game will, will struggle in regionals alabama doesn't do that that they they come out ready to play when the postseason gets started. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I'm really excited to see how that hunger that we saw at the end of the regular season and in the SEC tournament translates into the NCAA tournament. And like you said, this is a new experience for Clemson, but also it's a new experience for a lot of these Alabama players. You know, Lexi Kilfoyle has never pitched in the postseason. Savannah Woodard has never played in the NCAA tournament. Jenna Johnson has never played in the NCAA tournament. So there are some key pieces that are experiencing this for the first time on the Crimson Tide. But the way this team is banded together, as I talked about earlier, I have a hard time seeing that being a problem. And again, I'm really intrigued at what this team can do because we talked about it at the end of the broadcast. Earlier this year, there looked like a big four to win the national championship. UCLA, Oklahoma, Alabama, Arizona. Arizona kind of fell off a little bit. Then Alabama had the injuries to Bailey Dowling and Claire Jenkins and some other things that came up that made you think, well, this team might be a step below those top two because at the time UCLA and Oklahoma looked like they couldn't be stopped. Right. Now, after what we've seen the last couple of weeks, I firmly believe Alabama is back on that level with UCLA and with Oklahoma as a true national championship contender. This team has faced adversity beyond what we can even talk about in how much time we have for this pregame video, this little uh, breakdown of a Tuscaloosa regional. And I think that has prepared them for this postseason in a way that few teams can understand. So this is going to be a really fun NCAA tournament. And I think it, all get started with a fascinating Tuscaloosa regional with some teams that maybe feel disrespected, including the, Clem the, uh, the Clemson Tigers. Yeah. So this weekend it will be the Tuscaloosa regional Alabama as the number three overall seed in the NCAA tournament, hosting the two seed Clemson, the three seed Troy and the four seed Alabama here in this Tuscaloosa Alabama state in the Tuscaloosa regional game. One will be between Clemson and Troy. That's at two o'clock on Friday afternoon followed by Alabama and Alabama State at 5. We'll be on the air 
on the Crimson Tide Sports Network at 450. And then it's double elimination. Alabama will hopefully be playing in that winner's bracket game uh, on Saturday and then hopefully finishing things off on Sunday. Uh, but to get the full schedule, always go to RollTide.com and the schedule page for Alabama softball. That's where you can also get a link to the live audio for all the games for myself and Gray Robertson. I'm Tom Canterbury. Thanks for joining us here on Crimson Drive. And back to you, Roger. I mean, getting in the national championship is a huge accomplishment in any sport. Um, when we talk to recruits and we, we tell them, like, you come here and you're going to have a chance to win championships. And until this year, you know, that was just something we were saying. And now we can say to them, to their eye, like, this is, this is the reality. Like, anybody who's racing in this regatta has a chance to win the championship. And now we get to take our shot. I mean, we raced a grueling schedule. And we knew, having never been selected the championship before, we would have to have a body of work that would really be unassailable in the eyes of the selectors. So we raced everyone. And really nobody else did. And we had some good success. We had some, you know, we had some races that weren't as good as some others, but the reality is that we were unafraid of putting ourselves out there with the opportunity to try and make it to this moment. And we're pretty excited about it. I mean, this team, this is only half of our team. You know, there's, there's another 25 athletes that helped to get us to this point. And the fact that we're here right now is a, a testament to all the hard work that everybody put in. It, you know, there are a lot of people that worked really, really hard to help us get better that aren't here today, but had just as much an impact on our ability to be talking about even racing next week. I think the thing I've said to the team is that it's one thing to get to the NCAAs. It's another thing to take advantage of the opportunity and see how well you can finish. You know, and this next week and a half is going to be all about preparing to finish strong. And um, like I said, you know, it's a restart to the season. You know, everybody's everybody's season is starting from zero now. You know, there's no, you know, there's no like preconceived notions. The reality is, is that we all get to the starting line. We all have an opportunity to win this championship. So we're going to go out and take our shot and do the best we can. Honestly, a little disbelief because we have been working towards this ever since I transferred here. I obviously rode at Minnesota before and I came here and the first thing that Coach P said to me on the phone was, we want to get this team to NCAA. So we've been working towards that for three years. So when I saw that on the screen, just so much excitement, like we finally did that. And now I like, let's go. I'm so ready to go and just like show everyone what Alabama is. and. Like, Alabama is here. Like, we have done the work. We are a rowing school now, and, like, we can hang with the big dogs. I think it says a lot about our culture and that we can lean on each other. And even through all of the things with, like, corona and, like, all the other social justice issues that have been going on, like we have come together as a team and we've decided like if we're going to put energy into anything, it's our rowing and it's to lift each other up and to go to the national championship and just like show that we can, we can put in the hard work even with everything going on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't hit you until it's right up there because it's you know, isn't for sure till it's up there, but man, that is five years of hard work right there. Um, a lot of us, I mean, all of us have sacrificed a lot for, for this moment, um, whether that's coming back an extra year, coming back with COVID concerns, you know. Um, so seeing all that come, not to fruition, but see it all come to something is like incredible, especially when it's something we've never done before. That is just, a, I can't, it's indescribable. I'm sorry. <laughs> Right, yeah, this team is the definition of resilient. We're gritty, we're tough. Um, you put a challenge in front of us and we're going to knock it down. So um, these girls are unlike anything 
anyone I've ever met and I'm gonna miss it. Taking a look at our weekend schedule, of course, the Alabama softball team here in Tuscaloosa getting to host the 2021 NCAA Tuscaloosa Regional. And play will start for the Crimson Tide on Friday at 5 p.m. Central against Alabama State. And then the Regional will continue Saturday and Sunday. The field, of course, includes Clemson and Troy. They'll play each other tomorrow afternoon before Alabama plays Alabama State. And then it will be the Crimson Tide. And, of course, uh, likely playing Clemson at some point. And then hopefully on Sunday winning the championship advancing to a Super Regional, which if Alabama wins, would also be here in Tuscaloosa. Now, the baseball team, they are at home for the final time this year. It's Alabama at home against Mississippi State starting tonight at 6 p.m. We'll also have a booth cam available on our Facebook page, so make sure you come right back here to the Crimson Tide Sports Network Facebook page to watch the booth cam as Chris Stewart and I call Alabama and Mississippi State Game 1. Tomorrow's game also at 6 p.m. and then Saturday at 1 o'clock to close out the regular season. Alabama has already secured a berth in the SEC tournament and will play in Hoover, Alabama next week, but still a lot to be determined as to whether Alabama will make it to the NCAA tournament. So big games ahead for the Crimson Tide baseball team. And we certainly like to thank all of you for watching this edition of Crimson Drive. We apologize for a few audio difficulties we had earlier in the episode, but we really hope you enjoyed the conversations we had today. Again, Ikenna Smart, the wonderful story that he has had coming from Nigeria all the way to the United States to play collegiate basketball, now a grad assistant for Alabama, and make sure you help his cause in sending shoes back to Nigeria, a very important cause, and we certainly thank Ikenna Smart of not only Alabama men's basketball, but of Smart Sports for that conversation as well as Chase Lee talking about his journey from being a walk-on baseball player, not even making the team to becoming one of the best relievers in the Southeastern Conference. And then Tom and Gray really had a great breakdown of Alabama softball, and I think you'll enjoy getting to listen to them on the network this weekend as Alabama starts play in the regional, and Coach Putre and some Alabama rowers at the very end. Again, great conversations all throughout this edition of Crimson Drive, presented by Coca-Cola. Special thanks to our producer, Ethan Carabin. For all of us here at the Crimson Tide Sports Network, this is Roger Hoover saying so so long and good afternoon on this Thursday. Thanks for watching Crimson Drive, and now turn your radio on. A lot of big games coming up this weekend on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Roll Tide, everyone.